Hey guys, how's it going? So this is my first talk ever. So if it sucks, blame Rob Dixon. Uh, as uh, he said, the, the title of my talk is uh, Easy Creds Automating Man in the Middle for Winning. It is true that the first draft of this was written in tiger blood on paper, so... Who am I? I'm a security consultant with Acubon Labs. I've been in with Acubon Labs since about January of this year. It's a killer company. I love working for them. We're, we're hiring, so if you guys uh, want to come work for the best company in the world, you can come work for Acubon Labs. Uh, I'm known on Twitter as Bravo Hack, so if you guys want to follow me on that. And then in the IRC chat rooms, I'm uh, Johnny Bravo. So if, if I've trolled you at any point in time, I apologize. Uh, don't find me after the talk. A couple of quick call outs. Just wanted to call out Rob Dixon and say, hey, thanks a lot for letting me come here and do this. Hackers for Charity, of course. Pure Hate is my double first homeboy. He's, uh, he's the man with the plan. He's, uh, he kind of helped guide me with. Uh, with a script and getting it in the backtrack, which is really my ultimate goal. Emilio Escobar, he's another guy that works for Acubon Labs, and uh, I'm gonna talk about this at the end, but he basically, in a couple of days, rewrote EdgerCap and fixed a lot of the stuff that's out there. So as you guys know, I think the last actual official code release was like 2004. Some of the distros have kind of kept stuff up, but I've submitted bugs and uh, it's been months or years and haven't been fixed. So we'll talk about what, exactly what he fixed at the end. Uh, during this talk, we're gonna go over you know, high percentage random middle attacks, wireless attacks with easy creds, attacking the internal networks with easy creds, um, kind of the effective attack vectors, how you really go about it, why it kind of gets a bad name in the industry. Uh, when you talk about poisoning a man in the middle and it being cheating and all that stuff. Um, and then I've, I've got a few demos to go through easy creds and just kind of show you how simple it is to use and what you can accomplish with it. So high percentage attacks. So if you're behind the perimeter security controls, basically you're doing an internal assessment or an internal audit or a pen test, um, there's a few different uh, attacks that you can use. The art poisoning of, clothes, of course being kind of the most common. Has anybody ever used Edercap or Kane? Okay, for yourselves or actually during a pen test? Anybody during a pen test? Okay, cool. cool. Um, so as you guys know, it does a lot of stuff and it basically uses art poisoning to accomplish that. Um, different types of poisoning, there's also you know DHCP where the attacker's in race, race condition with the active DHCP server to assign an IP address to a victim. Um, DNS, uh, thanks to Iron Geek for his video up on his website, um, I added the, uh, the DNS spoofing attack to easy credits. And basically it's the same type of thing where you're kind of in a race condition to, to get the information out there. And it, it allows the attacker to spoof the site request with a, with a malicious site or IP that they own. ICMP is hardly ever used. Um, I've never used it, honestly. It's in there because it's just it's a valid attack vector. Um, basically, it's used to indicate that there's a shorter route to some particular destination. So what all these accomplish is basically getting the victim to route their traffic through your box. Um, and of course, we all know about wireless networks now. Fake APs have been around for a while, soft APs, different types. And there's a few different ones that are built into, uh, into the EasyCreds uh, script. So this part's kind of like jaded securities early earlier talk, it's 2011, why the fuck does this still work? I mean, I think uh, if you Google man in the middle or you Google art poisoning, you're gonna get 500,000 hits in less than a second. Yeah, I mean, there's a million different videos out there for it. Um, most organizations, they don't truly really understand the applicable threat of the attack. They don't really understand what it's doing. And because of that, they don't know how to defend it. So if they don't know how to defend it, of course it's always going to be a valid attack vector, you know. And I think I, I forget who I was talking to, but we were telling stories about someone who had switches that were 11 years old. Well, yeah. So right away, you know that if man in the middle is probably going to be possible in that environment. And um, there's only a few effective defenses against poisoning attacks. Uh, mostly are poisoning. There's two that um, that have kind of stopped me. The the big one is well. One of them is uh, uh, 
uh, port rate limiting, which limits the amount of traffic that can cross over a port at a given point in time, and then it'll shut the port off. So if you've got the traffic of 20 systems going through, you're going to trip the threshold, hopefully, that they've set. And then at that point, the port, port will shut down. Um, it doesn't always um, prevent it, but for the most part, that's a pretty effective defense. Uh, the one that will stop our poisoning cold is a dynamic ARP inspection. And dynamic ARP inspection with DHCP snooping, what it does is that you basically run DHCP snooping on your network for two or three weeks, and it builds a database of MAC addresses and everything for you. So when someone comes in to poison the network, it monitors and looks at all the ARP replies and requests. And if it doesn't match their table, it just drops it. So that's been the only um, defense that's really kind of worked. I can tell you I've been on several pen tests over the past five years, and the only place I've ever had it not work, it was on a retest after we'd already given them the finding, and they put in a poor rate limit and, and an MFR inspection. So this is definitely a valid attack factor. If you're doing a pen test, you should go through and at least try it. Do it on the guest network, do it on the regular network, and see what you get. The big reason why a lot of these companies don't fix it, we were saying uh, you know, they have old switches. It's a huge, huge, huge amount of money to go through and replace every switch that exists in a user environment. And so they just don't have the funding. You know, they've got a million other things and they want to make money. So they look at this as like not a big deal until you get some service account and then uh, 30 minutes later you're enterprise admin and then hopefully you can kind of convince them that this is something they need to fix. Uh, but in all honesty, I'd say 99.9% .9 of the places I've been, it's not fixed. So, so easy creds. What is easy creds? Easy creds is a bash script that I put together um, starting about a year ago. Uh, that really leverages some of the other tools that are in there. And we'll talk about the tools, but it's like SSL Strip, EdoCab, um, URL Snark, PSNP. And it puts them all into um, you know, the one script that'll run it all for you, it'll configure everything for you. You just basically type in the IP addresses of the gateway and, and who you want to go after, and, and it'll do it for you. So um, why did I write easy creds? A little comment there, never mind the DOS, nothing, nothing to see here, move along. Um, I was sitting at my home office a little over a year ago, kind of minding my own business, when I got a, a message from one of the employees that I worked with at the time, who happened to be in Germany, for a huge, huge, huge company. And uh, he was a Windows guy, and he used Kane all the time. And I guess. Kane, he didn't know how, to, I don't know if he didn't know how to update the word list, but of course it's all in German, so it wasn't catching the normal password or whatever. So he decided he was going to use Ettercat. Never used it before, um, as far as I know, never used it before. And uh, he's like, hey, um, have you ever used Ettercat? Because I used it and I DOSed the entire LAN, and I don't know what I did wrong. He's like, I see traffic coming to my computer, but then it doesn't go anywhere. And I was like, okay, well, did you uh, did you edit the editor.com file? Yeah, what's that? And, uh, and then I'm like, all right, well, for SSL, you gotta you know you gotta you know set the I set the print to zero. I gave him my my standard uh, uh, setup. You know, delete the comments for the SSL dissectors. He's like, all right, cool, but. It's still not working. I'm like, well, did you enable IP forwarding? And he's like, oh, how do you do that? So out of that, I just kind of sat down real quick. I did actually a quick search on offensive securities uh, forums and found Lucifer's site or Lucifer's post with regards to setting up a fake AP. So I kind of took that and put that into a script for him that he could run. It was all hard coded um, and kind of explained to him how to go through and, and add the stuff that he needed to. Um, and then from there, and I did it in Bash. Um, from there, it's, it's grown a lot, as you guys will see. But like I said, I scripted it in Bash. Why not? Why Bash and not something cooler? Number one, I'm not a developer. I don't know jack shit about developing anything. Um, I've never written anything in Python, C, anything like that. Bash was really the only thing I knew just from working with Linux. So uh, between uh, my little bit of knowledge and Google, I was able to put some stuff together 
and, uh, and, and get something going. But the cool thing too is uh, it's in batch, so it'll run on pretty much anything. And um, that last one, it, it's right now I've got it written, it's optimized for BT5, but what does that mean? All that means is that the paths that it calls the programs from are the default backtrack paths. So you could very easily go in and change those paths if you've got them installed and just call it, um, you know, you can do it in Debian or Ubuntu or whatever, basically anything that runs batch. In fact, I'm working on a, a Pony version now, which is, uh, I believe, a uh, Ubuntu server. So it'll just, uh, it'll run on that with no problems. So my disclaimer, of course, EasyCrest is a penetration tool and can cause some serious issues if misused. And as we found out this morning, it can cause some serious issues even if you use it correctly. So <laughs> <laughs> be careful. Um, and then I've got the standard GNU in there uh, that's also in the source code, basically without warranty, et cetera. So what, what tools does EasyCrest really leverage? Um, the default tools that are launched with pretty much every attack except the Karmat exploit attack um, includes a SSL strip and it's, it transparently hijacks HTTP traffic on a network, watches for the HTTPS links and tries to redirect it, maps those links to look like HTTP. So basically, if it can forward, if, if, it, if it can forward that same call over HTTP, it will. So it'll go over port 80. Um, if they're, that's basically if they're not doing any server-side checks of any kind. Um, I know like uh, Google's usually pretty good about stuff, and um, I think Xfinity actually is another one that'll, that, that'll catch it and, and just give you a bad request back. Edercap's the big one. Of course, it's the network security tool for man middle attacks. It does a lot more than just that, um, but it, it's kind of the, the linchpin for the, for the program, for the script. So. Uh, URL Snarf and DSNF, uh, both the collection of tools that passively monitor network for interesting data. The reason I use all four is because SSL strip might catch stuff that Edercap doesn't. Uh, URL Snarf, you can go ahead and you can see the actual traffic at the sites that they're going to. Um, and DSNF sometimes will catch stuff too that, that the other ones won't. So having all those together gives you a better chance of capturing as many credentials as you can. Additional tools that are included, Nmap, no explanation needed there. Hamster and Ferret, so this has a sidejacking option if you want to have sidejacking. Every attack asks you, do you want to do sidejacking as well? Uh, Ferret's a, a, a tool that sniffs and analyzes the packets as they come in. Hamster is what it uses to replay. Um, Airbase NG for the, for the wireless stuff. Um, as you guys know, you basically that's kind of the base for setting up your, uh, your fake AP there. Um, Aerodon, that's used in the, the DOS portion, the MDK3 portion of EasyCreds, and then MDK3 is a, a tool to exploit common 802.11 protocol weaknesses. So when Ramada Guest went down earlier, I don't know if anybody noticed, again, I apologize for that. <laughs> I did not mean that to happen, but unfortunately it did. Um, and then, of course, my exploit again, <laughs> no explanation needed there. Um, that's leverage during the Kermit exploit attacks. So what wireless attacks are actually available in easy threads? You've got fake AP static, fake AP evil twin, Kermit exploit, and DOS APs attack. Um, the fake AP static, you, you're assigning it a static ESSID and channels to broadcast on. So it's more of a targeted attack within an organization's assets. Um, you know, you can call it, you can set your ESSID to say H honors or Robotic Guest or you know Starbucks or whatever. Um, if you're you know, targeting a specific organization, you set it up as their name or whatever their wireless is and try to broadcast on the same channels. Um, the evil twin responds to all requests on all channels. It's kind of like as in it of a Yassiger. So basically this is, I'll call it a poor man's Yassiger, but um, I think this is way cooler just because I wrote it. But uh, you can very quickly and easily set, set up a fake AP evil twin and of course, those are good in coffee shops, airports, hotels, things like that. Um, the big thing is smartphones, right? There's, I think, 150 million smartphones in the United States, and 120 million of them, according to Nielsen, are used to uh, connect to the internet or connect wirelessly. Um, you know, iPhones are constantly beaconing. Androids are a little bit better, but most of the time when I set something like this up, 
I'm catching iPhones left and right. And it's all, I don't know if anybody uses them for work, but Active Sync goes over 443, and once they're inside your tunnel, you've got their password. So um, smartphones are really a, a, a big place, a good place to catch a lot of stuff. Uh, the Carmat Display Attack, as it says up there, similar to Eagle Twin, but with the browser autophone. Um, the only thing is, is all traffic's black hole to your device. So it's really an attack where they come to your site and they see that loading page or whatever you've set up to show them, but they're not getting out to the internet. So it kind of gives it away that they're being attacked or something's not right. Um, so that's more of a kind of a smash and grab type of attack again that you might want to use in one of those environments, coffee shops, airports, or hotels. Of course, only if you're uh, legally doing it in a uh, pen-tested environment. So, uh, then the last option that I recently added, which is in the dev that hasn't been released yet, is a DOS AP attack. So just because you set up a wireless attack doesn't mean people are going to connect to you. You know, They're usually going to stay connected to their own organization. Um, so I added in uh, DOSing with MDK3 in order to de-opt those clients in the hopes that they will now connect to yours. Because if you've DOSed or de off everybody from everything and they can't connect to that, hopefully they'll move over to you. Does it auto whitelist here? Yeah, so, um, and I've got a demo of it, so I'll show you what it does. There's two different attacks. There's actually a last man standing where it whitelists you and DOSes everything that it can see. And then there's one where it uses a blacklist where it uses arrow dump to go through create a list, um, you tell it what, it, it gives you a list of APs that it found, you tell it what APs you want, and it builds a list of BSS IDs, and then uses that as a blacklist. So, um, that was a good segue, thank you. Perfect. So, <laughs> I'm gonna show you a couple of wireless attack demos. Um, I wasn't ballsy enough to do them live, so I recorded them. Uh, the first one I'm gonna go through is just setting up and executing a fake AP static attack. Um, and this is the one we talked about where it's, it's more of a targeted attack against an organization or against somebody specifically um, that you're looking to, uh, to, to get their, uh, their creds or some other information about. And since I know flipping back and forth with the Mac is kind of slow, I'll set this one up to um, setting up and executing a fake AP and DOS to hasten the victim's connections. And as we go through these, I'll explain uh, kind of what each one's doing here. Everybody see that all right? So basically, um, for the um, wireless, there's some prerequisites that need to be set up. There's a whole list in there. The first time you go to use EC Cred, you should probably set it all up. You want to install your DHCP3 server. You can in install your Carmeta Split prereqs. Um, one thing, too, you absolutely have to add the tunnel interface that you're going to use so it knows where to serve up the, the IP addresses on. I might have paced these too slow, so if I did, I apologize. Basically, you can edit. Here you see your interfaces. It's AT0. That's what I use um, as my tunnel interface. So now I'm going to go ahead and go into the fake AP attacks. And those are the ones four items that we talked about, and we're just going to go ahead and execute a static attack. Boy, I, did, I paced these too slow, I'm sorry guys. I know my ASCII art blows, so if anybody can help me, I'd be uh, greatly appreciated. So we're going to execute our attack. So, is asking, please provide a path to save um, your logs to. It creates a folder for you on the desktop where it's going to put everything. Um, you have put the, uh, your interface is actually connected to the internet. In my case, it was ETH1. 
asking for your wireless interface. That's what you're going to set your, uh, your fake AP on. And the ESSID that you want to call your rogue AP. So, for example, there I have free Wi Fi. Again, you can put in H honors, you can put in Starbucks, you can put in whatever you want. And the channel you want to broadcast on. And there, put it in the monitor mode. So, go ahead and put in that interface. <laughs> And then your tunnel interface, as we talked about the, uh, in the prereqs, it had the DCP uh, interface section, ET0. It asks you if you, have a, uh, if you have a populated comp file. If you want to use it, you can. It'll ask you if you want to give it the path to it. In this case, I just said no. And what it does is it locks you through setting that up. So I'm just quickly entering some information that will um, build a dcp.com file for me. The first one's a network range, the second one's going to be the IP address of that tunnel interface. Pretty straightforward. Your subnet mask. Broadcast address that you want to use. Uh, your, the IP leases that you want to hand out here. I always just start with 100 and go to 200. I, I've never had 100 people connect to me at a given point in time. So you can use a smaller range if you want. And then finally, the DNS server. And I always use Google's DNS. So now the magic starts to happen. You can see it on Stairbase. Created the ACP comp, launched it, configures your tunnel interface, sets up the IP table to handle the traffic, launches tail for you so you can kind of see what's going on when people connect to you. I asked if you want to include a site jacking for this one, I said no. Launches your SSL strip, header cat. Uh, configures the IP forwarding for you, launches URL snark. So at that point, your attack's fully underway. Again, you know, um, I, I tried to pace this. I didn't, I didn't realize it was going to be so slow. I apologize. But uh, the cool thing is, is these are extern windows. So I mean, if you wanted to load a plugin on the fly, you could do that. So at this point, we're basically just waiting for somebody to connect to us. And um, the URL snark window is really something that I look at more for um, to know that the attack is going on. As you guys see, the information, once they start browsing around, start to fly on that screen. And when you're connected to 25 or 30 hosts, it's gonna, you're going to see a lot of information, and it's going to fly by way too fast for you. So that we have a victim that just connected to it. This happens to be my wife's laptop, I believe. <laughs> so, <laughs> my daughter loves it when I do this to her and her friends when they come over. And I walk in and I tell them, yeah, your password on Facebook is XYZ. <laughs> <laughs> then they change it, long stall, you know, poisoning them. <laughs> so you can see the sites are being visited. Again, when, when you're, this is one machine, but when you're attacking multiple machines, you're going to see that, that uh, URL snark window just flying by. SSL strip sometimes will throw errors. Doesn't mean that it broke or it stopped working. Um, I'm not sure exactly what those errors are all about. Sometimes if someone browses to something then leaves it, um, it'll throw an error saying that, you know, the site was left before connection could be completed or something. So, so we're looking at that, that white window, that error cap window. Hopefully we'll see something show up soon. Why are we fixing that for you? I'm sorry. What wireless picks are you using? I'm using an alpha card. Um, I think I'm using the uh, the 36UH or 36U. That's just a straight the the 
G1. I also use a, uh, there we go, we got a password. It says, oh no's, <laughs> I've been hacked. And that's their Facebook account. So um, I'm also watching them go through some of the other sites and I'll explain to you why. We talked about how sometimes the stuff doesn't show up in that air trap window because it's going to sites that you don't see and there's logins happening that you don't see. So one of the things that I built was a SSL strip parser, because I don't know if you guys have ever looked at the SSL strip data, it's just tons of stuff. So. Eric? Yes? Are each one of these going to be like a log file? They are, so um, wherever it had an option to use a log file for the program, I leveraged that. Where it didn't, it's logging the X, everything that happens in the X term is being logged. So within this folder that's created here, um, all the information for EdoCap, URL, SNARF, DSNF, SSL strip is all being stored. So let's see, it looks like we got another one. Users, victim, and passwords, I've been hacked. And that's uh, them logging into ESPN. You probably couldn't see it, but I also went to Twitter and some other things, some other sites. So. So basically, once you're done with the attack, you just hit Q, and it'll close everything out for you. Oh, we got another password there. Uh, hack me, and here's my Gmail password. Um, like I said, you hit Q, it closes everything out for you. Um, if you, for a wireless attack, it also take it out of monitor mode and everything for you. I tried to make it as clean as possible. And then I know we, uh, I want to go ahead and show you the, the fake AP DOS as well. Um, this one's kind of long as well, I apologize. But um, it basically walks through setting up the fake AP again and then um, beginning your DOS attack. And this, this is in version 3.6, which hasn't been released yet, I apologize, but um, we'll get that out there as soon as we can. So again, we're, we're gonna fake, set up a fake AP static. Again, you can use Evil Twin, you can use a Carmine Split attempt, you can use whatever you want. Um, in fact, you can just use the DOS as standalone by itself if you just don't like the place. I think I heard a story about somebody, and I won't mention any names, pure hate, about, uh, and I can say that because he's not here, but uh, he basically, I think he said his wife made him go to Black Friday shopping or something like that. And so he decided just to run MDK3 all day long against uh, in the parking lot. And uh, went in and asked some guys, hey, how does, your, how's your, uh, how does this thing connect to the internet? And they're like, oh, look, it's cool. Oh, I can't connect to the internet. <laughs> so, uh, so this one, you can see we're rocking two cards. We're setting the first one up. Uh, that's being put in the monitor mode. For my dossing, I normally use an end card. Uh, 2.4 and 5 gigahertz, and then for my um, for my fake API, I use a G. I, I just say that it's probably easier to set up the G for that because a lot of more a lot of uh, victims will connect versus throwing up an N with an N signal on a specific channel. Perhaps I could be totally wrong. But again, we're just <coughs> excuse me, we're just stepping through uh, setting that uh, fake AP back up. I changed it up this time and used a one-man shoe address because I was trying to be saucy. That's another thing too is if you know the IP address range or scheme, it probably makes sense to use that as part of your wireless um, because a lot of times you'll see a request for that address. And I have been places where it's requested an address that I have, it's not within the IP range I've given it. And they try to connect, but they don't. And I don't know if that's a bug with an airbase or I'm, I just don't know what I'm doing or what, but basically uh, I have seen uh, victims get turned away because of that. 
again, it's a, <coughs> excuse me, asking if you want a side jacking. It's going to go ahead and launch all the default tools. Configures all your arc recording. So the main thing that, that this does that, you know, it, I know it doesn't look like it from the videos, but it really cuts down a lot of time to set this stuff up and getting it going. I mean, uh, like I said, if I wasn't pacing this, I could have all this up in about two minutes or less. And then you're, you're off and running with an attack. <coughs> so at this point, I'm going to go back in. I'm going to do a DOS AP. And it leverages MDK3, as we said earlier. And it's using the D off option. Um, there's a last man standing, which I say, of course, use with caution. Um, you know, if you happen to be in a hotel, and, uh, not a hotel, I'm sorry, a hospital, and you use last man standing, you might not have some good results because you might be dosing something that uh, is critically needed. But um, in this case, we're going after either a single or a multiple, and it asks you, do you have the MAC address of the AP or the BSSID? And if you say no, then it'll go out and it'll fire up error dump for you automatically. You just give it the interface that you want it to run on. Puts it in monitor mode. You give it the interface. In this case, I think it's a long one. And this says down here, it's starting in our dump, it'll run for five minutes, then provide a list of APs to DOS, or the, uh, the demo I just set it to one minute. So basically, it's going through and it's seeing everything that I can find out there. It's running on all the channels. <coughs> Sorry. Every once in a while, you'll see your AP pop up and change. So we can catch that. See, there's two purple cheetahs there. One's on six. One's on eleven. Sorry, you probably can't see that from there. But um, if you're running an evil twin, you'll actually see that start to change on you. Switch to to all the different. Uh, APs that are being broadcasted. So it's running, and in the background, it's just basically going to dump a CSV file out to the temp directory. And then, <coughs> gosh, I'm sorry. Um, as you can see, it dumps a list of the APs that I found for you. So there's still a small bug I'm working on where there's a space, like this one says Bobby's network. That's really one AP, but it splits it off. So I'm going to go ahead and do a DOS attack against Purple Cheetah, which is my own network, because that's how I rock it. <coughs> um, so now it's DOSing Purple Cheetah. And what, all, all it's doing is, once you give it an input, it wraps for that out of the CSV file. So if you just put in purple, um, it, would, uh, it would basically take the purple cheetah and purple cheetah guest, two ESSIDs for that, put that into the file, use that as the blacklist. So, <coughs> excuse me, if you have like Caesar's guest or Caesar's and you want to just DOS everything, you would just put in Caesar's. So you can see down here, MDK3 is running, it's sending out some packets, and we're waiting for it to, to tee off. Somebody, and I think my wife's going to be a victim again here. address, she's connected to my network, you can see the DHCP uh, requests and replies down below, and it's starting to capture her traffic in that URL smart window, so I know I have a victim connected, um, and then she's going to go out and browse the internet at some point. What's that? Match.com. Match. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My wife's like, yeah, yeah I'll show him. <laughs> the cool thing is, is um, when you're running sidejacking, um, if someone's chatting like on IRC or something, you'll see it being echoed in that window, which is kind of cool. 
Uh, but that was something that I just kind of caught myself when I was goofing around. And I was like, oh, I can see what's going on here. So basically, I just quit out of that. Again, it closes everything out for you. Everything's logged uh, into that directory for you for review later on. And um, sorry. Are you there? So everything's logged in that folder for you for review. The different logs, the, the extern windows, uh, things like that. Um, so that you can document it for your customers as well, add it to the, uh, add it to your, uh, your examples and your, your evidence. So attacking from within the perimeter, of course, a little bit different. You're actually plugged in. Um, as I talked about earlier, our poisonings are basic in one way. Those are the two uh, most used attacks. Basic will poison the gateway and the victim. One way will just poison the victim. Um, I use one way if I'm trying to be a little bit more stealthier or where they might have the network protected but not the host. So I was at a client where they had, uh, as Jaded Security was saying, all the blinky lights and they had host based IBS and they had all the stuff that you can imagine. But they weren't protecting their art tables on their clients. So it didn't really matter. Um, so I just used a one-way poison against them and was able to, uh, to get inside their SSL tunnel. And then they used SiteFinder as their uh, authentication, which uh, was set up with base64 base encoding, which isn't even encrypted, so it gets decrypted by other capital on the fly. Uh, DCP poisoning, DNS spoofing, ICMP poisoning. As I said, I've never used the ICMP poisoning before. It's in there if you want to give it a run. Um, DCP poisoning, DNS spoofing. Those last three are probably more for a guest network. You probably want to run those um, uh, within the guest network because they don't recover the same way heart poisoning. Heart poisoning will recover if you crash it or you start to stop your attack or something happens. It takes a little bit, but the art table is going to get rebuilt fairly quickly. With DHCP poisoning, uh, ICMP poisoning, that doesn't happen. So you can really jack somebody up pretty bad. Uh, the DNS spoofing actually leverages um, an art poison to begin with, and then the uh, DNS spoofing plugin. Uh, with an editor cap. So I'm going to show you guys one more demo here with regards to setting up and executing a basic art poisoning and we're going to include side jacking with this. Uh, that includes uh, the hamster and ferret options. So the same menu, basically we're going to take a look at the editor.com file. I always set mine to, to be zero so the privileges don't really drop. You don't necessarily need to do that, but I just prefer to do it. Um, there's a couple other changes I make. Of course, you've got to delete the uh, comments from uh, the reader lines for IP tables for uh, the SSL dissector. And then also, it says Mozilla in the remote browser. I just changed that to Firefox. This also has an editor DNS edit uh, when you want to set up your DNS booting. So we're going to go ahead and do a poisoning attack. And uh, the first option up there is to create a victim host list, standard art poisoning, one way art poisoning, DHCP poison, DNS poison, ICMP poison. So I'm going to create a victim list. Uh, this is where a map gets leveraged, basically does a quick ping scan uh, on the network. So I know that there's my IP and there's my mask, so I know it's a slash 24. So I put in the, uh, the range that I'm sitting in and enter. It performs a, a, a real quick scan to see what devices are live. Um, the cool thing is, is, oh yeah, remember to remove any IPs that should not be poisoned. HSRP will kill you if you poison both the physical NICs and the virtual NIC that's created as the gateway. That's the quickest way to DOS somebody. You'll see the output from Nmap actually puts it into EdoCap format for you automatically. Um, there's the gateway. There's my Ubuntu machine. 
once you've got your victim list, you can go ahead and start your, uh, your poisoning attack. And I'm just going to do a standard art poison for this one. So it's similar to the way we set up the fake AP. I, I, I try to reuse as much code as I can when interfaces connected to the network. Uh, where do you want to save your log files to? Just put it there on the desktop. Sets up your IP tables. Uh, do you have a populated victims file to use? I say yes in this case because I built one. If you don't, you can go ahead and put, uh, it would ask you to input your victims in Entercat format. Uh, so basically you just give the IPs or the IP ranges that you want and it will build a list for you. Provide the path to the victim file. The IP address of the gateway is 11.11.14.1. Hit enter, and it's going to go ahead and ask if you want a sidejacking attack. We're going to say yes. Has anybody used hamster and ferret before? Somebody? Yeah. It's similar to Fire Chief, I guess. I never used a Fire Chief plugin, but uh, I know it uh, works, works about the same way. Again, it does everything for you, it configures everything for you. So all you got to do is set it up and let it fly. There's ferret. It's uh, doing the uh, Capture this traffic. Hamster. Uh, right here, basically, for uh, hamster, you've got to set your proxy in Firefox to 1234. Time to get some. Enjoy. I hear Boris uses gerbils. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard that too. I've heard that too. They're a little bit more frisky. <laughs> that's, that's why he's so uh, uptight, I guess, huh? A little wound up. Hey. So basically, so I set up my proxy to handle it. Uh, gonna set it up. Go to the hamster site here. Had to make sure I used a machine that didn't have U porn in the address line there in the drop down. <laughs> so that's what that's what hamster looks like. Uh, I'll show you once the attack starts. Uh, how it, how it shows you the different cookies and stuff. So now we're basically poisoning. Um, you can see the traffic there in the ferret window. <laughs> Going crazy. And hopefully we'll see a connection anytime now. There we go. So that's just a straight FTP, Anon, evil ad hacker. That's Microsoft's FTP site. If you want to go that? I don't know why it's still up, but it's probably not even really Microsoft. So you can see they're browsing around on the internet. They're going to different sites. Twitter.com. It's flying by there. So, uh, as I stated, I mean, there's logins that are happening right now, and you notice nothing's happening in the intercap window. And I'll show you how to get that out of the SSL script input. So th there's sometimes there's an issue with speed uh, with regards to your victims, depending on what type of network you're sitting on, what type of connection you have. Um, and you really want to make sure that you're being responsible about how many you're poisoning and what you're poisoning. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Looks like we got an evil hack and I have skills. This is our ESPN.go login so you can uh, go mess up their fantasy football stuff. We have another one, Evil Hacker. You want to change their Facebook account stuff. So you can see it's the same methodology that's used throughout the entire attack. So you can, it leverages it for wireless or for wired attacks. It's pretty straightforward and, and easy to
some point I'm actually going to bring up the, the window there and show you. Here's another one. Evil hacker, hacking something or other, and that's Comcast. So, so now when you open up Hamster, you see that basically it's got some, some information there. I was poisoning 150. 150 I was on the VM, so I think 156 was the, uh, was the host. So up at the top, it separates ones where it believes that it has um, login information. So for these sites, if, if someone validly logged in, I would be logged in as them at that point. So you can go in and go to ESPN.go.com and the sites that they visited as them. So funny story I heard one time, some guy was doing this in a hotel and found a bunch of hacker stuff going on. Someone was requesting to set up a fake site for, uh, for stealing credit cards. And uh, I was, not, I, I wasn't, I mean, somebody was doing a sidejacking attack. And at that point, <laughs> at that point attack, and at that point I noticed that I was able to log into this, I forget what the site was, but it was like Black Hat something or other. It wasn't the, the Black Hat conference, but. It was somebody definitely trying to be a be a hacker, and uh, I was able to, to change a lot of their, but the person was able to change a lot of their information. So, <laughs> so um, as sorry again, sorry for the demos. I tried to paste them. I, I didn't realize it would take that long. Um, definitely next time I'll make sure that that it goes a little bit quicker. But. Um, Credential gathering and easy creds. You, you saw we were doing a lot, we were capturing a lot of stuff. There's a lot of windows that were open. Again, it's trying to catch as much traffic as you can to be as successful as you can. Um, not, all, not all captured credentials will show up in the under cap window. I see so many posts online on the offsec forum where it's like, oh, I'm using SSL strip and under cap, and under cap's not catching stuff. Well, that's because you've set up your IP tables to transfer information, and sometimes packets get dropped and things happen. So. That's why you run SSL strip, and then you actually have to look at the data. So one of the things that I hated doing was trying to go through that mountain of data that SSL strip spits out, and just trying to find usernames and password. I mean, do the normal search for pass or user, but it's not just the posts that come up, it's all the other junk because it grabs you know everything on the page. I've limited it now instead of capturing everything to just capturing the post traffic, but it still gives you a bunch of junk. So I wanted an easier way to do it versus sitting down for three hours wasting my time. So I wrote an SSL strip parser, which basically leverages a definition file. And uh, I thought this was like the coolest thing that everybody would like, but um, so far I haven't gotten any real feedback on it. But um, you basically just give it um, the name of the site, the, um, a, a value that can determine that it's that site. Um, and then the username and password value, as far as um, you know, what is actually being posted, and then it, it goes through the strip, the SSL strip parser, and, and finds that information, and it will present just that back to you. So another one more. I swear this demo is quicker, but it's for parsing the output files and the credentials for for credentials. So you can see we've got all our stuff that we did before. Here's the definitions of SSL strip file. Um, we've got our easy crags uh, folder that has all the information in it. We're going to do a data review option. We're going to parse the SSL strip log for accounts. So at this point, you enter the full path to the SSL strip log file, which is sitting in there. And as you can see, you've got your DSNet, your EnterTrack ECI. You've got uh, I closed the window, but it'll come back up. <coughs> so you give it the actual log file and the path to your definition file. In this case, it's sitting here on the desktop. So I'll just pop that in there, hit enter, and boom, you can see it gives you an output. There's Twitter, session, and username. The only thing is, is it's, uh, it's encoded, so you know a space will show up as a percent 20. Uh, those types of things, but 
a lot of the stuff that we didn't necessarily capture, this might be better. Um, you've got Twitter, you've got Comcast, ESPN. I think I ran it twice, so it, it doubled it up. But so it'll tell you exactly what site the user was on and what the passwords were for that. So instead of scrolling through that in a giant text file, you can basically just run this parser and it'll pull it out. And like I said, it's really easy to update it. Uh, the definitions of SSL strip. I just use tamper data and see what actually gets passed during the post, and I pick those. So uh, DSNF, a lot of times I'll catch um, uh, you know, uh, SNMP traffic or some other things uh, within that. Um, they don't really catch a lot of stuff, like in this case it's empty. Uh, but you can see it's creating a It's creating the files for you here on the side. I might do it so that it's actually going to put it back in there, but um, in this case, it just prints off to the, to your present uh, path. You've got your Evercat PCI file in there, and you can parse that. And you'll see the creds that it caught, and you'll see Twitter. Uh, you can't tell, but Twitter's not in there. It's not one of the ones that got caught. So that's a a uh, situation where SSL strip caught something that um, Metacap did not catch. So there's just one other thing it's going to show here, and that's that the entire editor cap term window gets captured. Again, so you can have it as your evidence. It goes through, it dumps the whole thing. You've got you know, your DHCP requests, you've got your passwords, whatever else might have been in there, it logs the entire external window for you. And uh, the URL snark is the same way. It logs basically everything you went through. So you can let, you know, leverage it together to hopefully find out some, some good stuff about your uh, your victims. So effective attack vectors, you know, why, why does poisoning have a bad name in the industry? Number one, it's inexperienced pen testers. I'm Joe Pentester, um, I'm gonna sit down and poison everything on your network. Or their attack for the day for poisoning starts with man enter cap or oxid.it download cane. If that's how the attack starts, don't do it. That's, you should know what you're doing ahead of time. Um, lack of customer education before testing. You need to tell them that bad stuff could happen. You know, uh, users can be affected. I've had poisoning sessions where I've got full buy-in and they're okay with stuff, but they do maybe uh, some type of banking at the accounting level where there's server-side certificate checks. And so that, that whole, you know, entire segment of users can no longer do any type of uh, banking for the company because they can't actually log into the site. Um, poisoning is not cheating. I hear this all the time. Oh, well, you poisoned and you got a password and that's cheating because now uh, you're on the network. Well, it doesn't matter. You get so much junk when you poison. You get, you get people's Facebooks, you get people's Gmails, you get people's, uh, you know, all kinds of stuff. But the only thing that's really good for is checking for password reuse on their actual network credits. Because a lot of times when you do get a credential that comes through, it's gonna be in MTL unhatched. So you're, you're not gonna, and it's gonna have the challenge and everything. So it's not something that's, that you can just throw in and crack it. Um, and also, just because you get a cred, very rarely will you get the domain admin cred just flying around. I have, I have had that flying around in the clear before, but it's very far and few between. There's a lot of work to be done. I can tell you though, if you do get one valid password, be it a service account, whatever, you you pretty much it's only going to be a matter of time for you own the entire environment. I mean, I've it, I've taken a service account for I don't know, Cisco or something, and and own the entire environment within 30 minutes. So uh, as long as you got something that you can pass around and use, then you know you're going to be able to get onto a box, and most of the time. All the local, all the boxes have the same build, right? The same local administrator, username, password. 
So you just use incognito, you run that around, and, and you're good to go. Um, do your research for a more targeted attack. Don't poison what you don't need to. Talk briefly about HSRP. Does anybody know what HSRP is, the protocol? Uh, so for, basically, it's, it's the hot standby routing protocol. So what happens is uh, it's failover. So they have two physical machines with two physical NICs that create a virtual gateway. I think in PFSense it's called CARP, so if anybody's familiar with that. So if one goes down, the other one will be okay. So the, a virtual NIC, usually on the dot one, is the gateway that's created. So if you poison those three IPs, we'll say dot one, dot two, dot three, you've poisoned everything in every way for, for the entire organization to get out through that gateway. And it's just gonna go to your laptop, come back around, go to your laptop, come back around. It's, it's never gonna go anywhere. Um, so make sure you do your research. You don't need to poison printers, you don't need to poison void phones. You know, look, look for that diamond in the rough. Well, you want to capture the things people are printing to the printer. You, I mean, yeah, you could. <laughs> yeah, you definitely, you definitely could. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying don't, but I'm saying, you know, make sure you know what you're poisoning. Because a lot of times, like I said, people, is man enter cap. Okay, uh, yeah, slash, slash, space, slash, slash. And they blow up the entire, um, the entire VLAN or the entire broadcast domain they're sitting in. And they don't realize the, the availability that gets affected or how slow the network gets at that point in time. That's another thing. If, if who here thinks that a VM can actually handle three, uh, you know, 150 or 200 users, all their information flying through your VM at a given point in time? Anybody? Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> because it, it can. I mean, you really want to target 10 to 20 at a time. Let it run for 20 or 30 minutes, maybe a little bit more. If you've got some good targets, you know that you're sitting in uh, somewhere where you have access to the admins and network admins, whatever. Try to see if you can't figure out what their IP address is or their IP range if you're sitting in it, and, and just poison those. You know That's gonna be a lot more effective than just you know blowing it all out there and seeing what you're gonna get back, because the customer's really gonna get pissed when they can't do any work. Um, know when to use each type of attack. What makes sense? Internal, does this make sense to run it on the internal network? Would I be better off on the guest network? Would I be better off doing a wireless attack and getting all these iPhones that connect to me and just you know, use active sync uh, credentials and, and steal it that way? Um, where are you at? What's the scenario? What do you have approval from from your customer? The guest network, I love it when they say, well, this just connects to the internet, so we're cool. But they don't realize, like I said, the iPhones sync up there, people bring in their, you know, their laptops, they don't want to be tethered, so you know, they might have to run to a meeting. So you know, a lot of them will just use the guest network out of the guest wireless out of convenience. Um, not necessarily uh, because uh, they have to. You know. So just, just know your environment, know what you're doing, and uh, be smart about your tags. So where can I get this easy creds? Uh, it was recently accepted into the Backtrack 5 repos, so if you've got that, just app get update, app get, in, app get install. It'll install EdgerCap, and the next slide I believe we're gonna, or two slides from now we're gonna talk about why that might not be a good thing uh, with the current version. You can get it on SourceForge. Uh, please, if you use it, please provide feedback, seriously. Um, I wrote this for myself. I never thought that anybody else would ever be using it. So if you do use it and you think it sucks, please tell me and tell me what sucks and then maybe I can fix it. Like, there's a guy on SourceForge gave, gave me a thumbs down and didn't provide any feedback. So it's like, okay, it was probably Boris, but. <laughs> <laughs> uh, demos and videos, again, it's, it's basically what we watch, but they're up on YouTube. Um, I'll do some of the other ones as well. Uh, that's another reason why it's, it's uh, the, the demos were probably a little bit too long specifically for this, just because they, they were put up on YouTube and it's more for an edu educational purpose. Um, uh, but as you guys can see, that I means it's pretty straightforward and easy to use. Um, with great power comes <laughs> great responsibility. Please do not place it in the hotel network tonight. I know it's fun, but it's also illegal. So um, that's, that's another one of my disclaimers. Evercap L3 errors. How many people have gotten a send L3 error? Doesn't that suck? Yeah. Did you Google for it? Yeah. What'd you find? Bunch of crap. Bunch of crap. Bunch of other people saying I'm getting this error. I don't know how to fix it. No fix. So there's a fix. There's a fix now. 
So a lot of people reported this L3 error message when EverCap and SSL script were run together in the kernel 2.6.39-4. Basically, once BT5R1 came out, uh, easy cards went to shit because EverCap just throws that error nonstop. Everything still worked, but that window would just fill up with errors, and it, it, it was kind of unusable. So the guy I mentioned earlier, Emilio Escobar. I've been working on this problem for, like, what, Lee? Eight months. Uh, because I knew it was an issue before our one came out. And he patched it in like an hour. So <laughs> it's just finding the right person. Uh, a patched version of EdCap's been applied to the test repos in Backtrack 5. Update your source list, uh, include test in there to pull it down and test it. It hasn't been, you know, since it just happened. Um, I've tested it on mine, it works fine, but until it gets further testing, uh, it won't get uh, moved into the actual. Um, the, the, the final uh, updates. Um, so basically, what what was happening too, so the L3 errors, what they are is, for whatever reason, I don't know what, uh, when, when you do a manual update to the IP tables, you would get an EPERM. It's basically the socket, the send to, would get a permissions issue, which is odd, because you're running everything as root. So we, I didn't know if it was just an informative error that was just annoying. So, you uh, kept on people has been developed for quite a while. Is Backtrack now keeping their own source tree for it and doing patches, or is anybody continuing the project? Yeah, so, um, you know, if you look at, like, if you do a search for, like, on Launchpad for, like, Ubuntu, you'll see that people are submitting stuff. I've submitted stuff, because there's another issue that, that comes up. But is anybody uh, actually taking that and putting it into the main? No, most, well, some stuff gets worked on, some stuff gets triaged, but for the most part, it's not really being kept up to date. So with Emilio just kicking ass, I was like, dude, we just need to fire fire up a new development effort on it. I mean, he was able to fix issues that have been killing me uh, for a while. And uh, he's like, oh yeah, I see the problem. After like three seconds of looking at the code. So I'm like, it was funny because I'm like, yeah, I'm sending you all this information. Um, I'm putting a $500 bounty on each issue here and here's two issues. And uh, I figure maybe that'll get somebody to want to work on it. And he's like, oh, here, I fixed the first one. And he's like, oh, here's the other one too. I'm pretty sure I fixed that too. You just need to test it. So within a day, I owed a guy a thousand bucks. You know, it just blew my mind. But it was cool because it is a dead project. EdCap is dead. And unfortunately, I'm not a coder, as I said earlier. And if EdCap's dead, since it's kind of a linchpin of what this does, easy creds could be dead too. So. Um, but yeah, he, he totally kicked ass on it and knocked it out, and, um, and it, it should get committed fairly shortly. Since I'm friends with Martin, it was basically, I sent an email to Dookie and Martin, I just diffed the, the, uh, the send EC, the EC send .c file, I said here's a patch. So uh, basically what it does is it, he just changed it from using LibNet to send it to using PCAP send, which is, I don't know if at the time, um, EdCap was originally written or committed if PCAP send was available. But I mean, it uses it still uses LibNet for a lot of stuff, it still uses PCAP for a lot of stuff. It looks like 2005 is the last major revision of EdCap that right. was on the official. Right, yeah. So it's been, what, six years, going on seven years? Have you ever looked at the forums? These last time I checked yeah, them, yeah. yeah, it's filled with spam <laughs> and nothing else. Yeah, yeah. So, in fact, I actually emailed the guys, because there's actually a Pete's Red issue that exists. If you're poisoning a bunch of people, um, EdCap doesn't properly close, um, doesn't do a P thread exit properly. So basically, you just run out of resources on your box and then the EdCap window will close. So that was one of the ones he's like, oh, I see the problem, I'll fix that. And he did it in like an hour. Um, so that was a big one that was haunting me because you get maybe, you know, depending on uh, how much traffic you're getting, 30 minutes to an hour of actual poisoning. Uh, maybe not even that long before that, that window just closes. Or if you find something that's good with a lot of traffic, it'll close even quicker on you. Um, I had a workaround where I set my max threads to like 9 billion something, and it still, uh, it gave me like an extra five minutes of time, so not a, not a whole lot. So I've got a little challenge here for you guys. This is really just because I want you guys to go out and download my program, but uh, review the source code for EasyCred 3.5 and decode the message at the top. Uh, email your answer to jbrob.hacks at gmail.com. Uh, first person to answer correctly, I'll buy them an HFC shirt. So. 
Thank you guys very much. Don't forget to give to Hackers for Charity. Any questions? I know we answered a few during those long ass demos. Cool. Anybody wants to see a live demo after the show? Let me know. All right, we're gonna move some things around real quick while we get set up for the podcast. Where's the drop box? Take any out. Yeah. Oh, Dump on the floor. The rest of the floor.